hello uh, everyone assalam alaikum good evening namaste and satsri akal uh, from lahore uh, welcome to the fourth season of sunday stories live uh, i'm uh, very happy to have your company uh, and i think like it will be a fantastic uh, uh, conversation that we have uh, today uh, my name is farooq khan and i will be your mc uh, for the event uh, today it's my pleasure to welcome you to this episode where we will we'll converse in with a great scholar uh, uh, um, professor amrit deep uh, and this event uh, uh, series will be taking place every sunday and so please be sure uh, to join us uh, uh, in the in the next few weeks that we have uh, little bit about myself i've been teaching uh, partition and working on partition for over uh, uh, two two and a half decades uh, my mother's family comes from uh, the gurdaspur uh, area of of punjab uh, and i've been involved with uh, 1947 partition for a few uh, years uh, 1947 uh, uh, partition archive documents the nearly lost history of partition and their flagship history project is the largest of its kind in south asia and so far has documented more than 10000 families uh, stories uh, today as i said earlier it's my honor uh, to continue uh, the sunday stories live tradition and facilitate what i will be a fascinating conversation with professor uh, amrit jit singh uh, let's welcome him send him a like or a heart since we can't uh, hear you clapping uh, let me just Uh, tell you a little bit about him, and this was something that I uh, uh, kind of spoke with him earlier on because he's had such a long and distinguished uh, uh, career. Uh, I think if I go through that, it will just end up taking a lot more time. So, with his permission, uh, I'm going to shorten this a little bit, and some of the work that he's done, uh, it will come up in our uh, conversation. Uh, Professor Amritjit Singh uh, is a Langston Hughes Professor Emeritus. of english and african american studies at ohio university uh, currently he is visiting fellow at south asia institute uh, university of texas uh, austin uh, he is a past president of the society for the study of multi ethnic literature uh, of the united states uh, uh, another association that is headed is united states association for commonwealth literature and language studies as well as the south asian a literary uh, uh, association uh, he received the uh, miles lifetime achievement award in 2007 and the south asian literary association distinguished achievement award in scholarship in 2014 uh, he served as a visiting professor at westlin university in new york university university of california at berkeley he held research uh, position fellowships at yale harvard uh, and is an internationally known scholar of american uh, and african american uh, studies uh, post colonial studies on and, and works on migration and immigration as well uh, he's lectured widely uh, uh, in europe africa and asia and has served as a visiting fulbright for professor at universities in berlin in graz uh, alexandria in egypt and new delhi he's authored and edited Uh, over 15 books and i will just mention uh, uh, three uh, the novels of harlem Har renaissance this came out in 1976 uh, post colonial theory and the united states in 2000 uh, interviews with edward said in 2004 uh, and in 2016 uh, uh, was revisiting india's partition essays on culture memory and politics this came out in uh, 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 2016 so as i said uh, the, i can i could go on uh, but i will stop here and say uh, uh, professor singh what an honor it is and thank you so much for taking the time and speaking uh, with us so a very warm welcome to you sir thank you sir uh, pleasure to speak with you dr farooq khan and i look forward to our conversation maybe at the outside that you i should say that i am also pindi born yes yeah, I, so I, we, are, we are both pindi uh, boys we are two pindi boys kind of pindi boys and garden college yes uh, uh, boys uh, kind of just kind absolutely. of absolutely 
Yeah. yeah, and when I visited in 27, it was just uh, wonderful. It was amazing to, uh, you know, and, reconnect and, in some ways. Yeah. And then that's the place that I have kind of, I grew up in Rawalpindi in Gordon College where my father used to teach as well. So let's kind of start uh, uh, with that, which is, you know, as a uh, Sikh from Punjab, uh, partition must have played a role in your family's history. And perhaps it's best to start from your recollection of how you first became aware of this particular event. Yeah, so uh, as you can imagine, uh, uh, I was not old enough to remember uh, anything about uh, uh, Rawalpindi or about the partition or even about the migration directly. But and, and this is one of the things we tried to mention in the title of this conversation today. Uh, moving beyond partition history and memory. How memory has a way of uh, uh, building up in good ways, but memory also be can become a trickster. It can become a difficult thing. So to keep the, my story simple, uh, my father, we were, we are, our family is originally from Gujarat, from uh, near Karya. There was a village named Doria. And my grandfather was the headmaster of a middle school in Karyan, Munshi Sundar Singh. He was quite well known. But my father lived most of his working life uh, in Rawalpindi. He ran private schools and he taught Punjabi at Garden College. And uh, our family had got, gotten attached to the family of uh, a well-known doctor, Hakim Amir Ali who treated my mother as one of his daughters. He had uh, three daughters and one son, and he was well known and he was uh, uh, quite well off. So he sent a message for my father to come and see him in February, 1947. I've kind of nailed down the date because the big riots took place in March. So it was definitely well before that. And he said, uh, I want you to take your family to the other side of the border. You are like my own blood. You are like my own children. And I don't want to uh, see you butchered here, which is a very likely possibility. Fortunately for us, my two maternal uncles, my mamas, they lived uh, in Muksa in Ferozpur district. And they were rich farmers. They hosted 63 people for Uksa. For a, for a whole year. Wow. The, the, the farming workers, they had their quarters, they were vacated, and they were turned into small flats for several families. And my father was the one who alerted other members of the family. So when I was uh, back in Pakistan in October 27, I was very keen to meet that family. And uh, I was able to meet wow. the granddaughter, uh, the son's daughter, and her husband, who had been a, a military attache in the Pakistani embassy in Delhi. Oh, and they wow. had formed very warm relationships yeah. with the uh, uh, Sikhs and Hindus uh, in Delhi. So it was an amazing meeting. I mean, I was sitting next to uh, uh, this woman. And believe me, I felt I was sitting next to a sister of mine. Because Absolutely. she was the granddaughter from the father's side and I was the granddaughter from the mother's side because my yeah. mother was like a daughter to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Dr. Amir Ali. And mm -hmm. I understand his own grandfather, grandparents were six. And he very proudly displayed their pictures oh, wow. in his drawing room. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this is how this is mixed up. So on our side then, because we hear so many terrible stories about partition, but the story of my family is uh, a good one in a way, mm. Mm. a very happy one. At least uh, uh, no one in our immediate family uh, got killed. Thank God for that. Yeah. 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 So, and, and, kind of then after a partition how did what can you kind of remember about from your uh, parents the part of settling in and uh, oh yeah the, yeah 
uh, yeah that uh, that is a very important chapter in my life too but uh, uh, do you mind if i read uh, take couple yeah. of minutes to read the yeah, poem yeah, please, by please do please do please do the poem the poem by part ordered by partition i found it on my phone i tried to please. print a copy and that was not very good copy but so part Arden, whom I interviewed as a graduate student in 1972, he lived in the village very close to NYU, where I was a graduate student. So a friend of mine and I just knocked on his door, and he asked us to come back, and we interviewed him, and we published. He had a connection to India. His brother was uh, the director of the Archaeological Survey of India, and was married to a Bengali Brahmin woman. and arden visited india around 1950 so he had a special feeling and i i'm often surprised that his poem partition is not known as well as it should be known in south asia so this is how it goes without taking more time <laughs> unbiased at least he was when he arrived on his mission having never set eyes on the land he was called to partition between two peoples phonetically at odds with their different diets and incompatible gods time that briefed him in london is short it's too late for mutual reconciliation or rational debate the only solution now is in separation the wise right thinks as you will see from his letter that the less you are seen in his company the better so we have arranged to provide you with other accommodation we can give you four judges two muslim and two hindu to consult with but the final decision must rest with you shut up in a lonely mansion with police day and night patrolling the gardens to keep the assassins away he got down to work to the task of settling the fate of million the maps at his disposal were out of date and the census returned almost certainly incorrect but there was no time to check them no time to inspect contested areas the weather was frightfully hot and a bout of dysentery kept him constantly <laughs> on the trot but in 7 weeks it was done the frontiers decided a continent for better or worse divided the next day he sailed for england very could quickly forget the this case as a good lawyer must return he would not afraid he told his club that he might get shot so that uh, sums up and we know other details how a guy named menon he was asked to prepare the plan for the british parliament i think once it became clear to the british that they have to leave there is absolutely no interest in the safety of human being they just wanted to scram from there yeah, yeah. so to go back to the question you asked so my father uh, ended up with a job at uh, uh, a college in ambala which was by the way a reincarnation reincarnation of dav uh, rawalpindi dav rawalpindi became gandhi memorial college in ambala okay. so we come to ambala and my father so he had missed the best opportunities to get a rehabilitation property but bribes would do miracle but he would he refused to bribe so we ended up in a, a slum in 1948 and for 6 years we lived there and our immediate neighbors were tanga walas and mongpali walas and gobara walas uh, but i i grew up with them and it it is a very deep part of me mm -hmm. a lot of the good things about me people you know all around uh, the place know me i think the good things come out of it and if uh, sometimes i'm not <laughs> perceived as so great maybe they also come from that but i never see saw these people complaining about saying any hateful things about muslim I'll tell you, it just was amazing. The singular focus was, are improving the lives of their children, Hindus and Sikhs, and it, it was a 
mohalla which with two gates two masjids at each end and the masjid property that to this day have been retained people are living in that but they cannot own that that property mm. Mm. because if a, a dozen muslims showed up in ambala even today they could claim one of those masjids mm. 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 but there were two gurdwaras there was a hindu temple now it's called ranjit nagar i visited okay. there in uh, 2015 and uh, some things have improved many other things have not improved particularly the sanitation but fortunately to finish the story very quickly a friend of my father was able to he was leaving ambala for delhi he was a medical doctor and he was very close friend and he told my father kesar singh i my practice cannot feed my family of six so i'm going to delhi and now don't be a damned fool move in before i move out mm. Mm. fortunately my eldest brother was a college student uh, in fact i think he had finished college yeah he was i think he was an ms student so he started sleeping at that place because people have could break the locks and move in and then you couldn't get the move because they'll go and bribe the rehabilitation department and get the name the property Uh, 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 you know uh, given to them legally so then we moved in a four bedroom house and it was a very nice place so from 1954 to 1964 my when my father moved from ambala to rotak he was also a professor as i told you uh, we lived in that house and i grew up in ambala so my memories are just amazing mm. Uh, mm. you know Uh, how people cope with poverty how they push their children and my father because he was one of the few educated people in that particular locality in that mohalla he will constantly be asked to give advice and i remember one vivid thing there was a family where the older brother was a hindu the younger brother was a sikh and they lived together and they made their sons alternately sikh and hindu <laughs> oh, yeah oh, oh. and they came to consult uh, my father about one of uh, their boys and my father said send him to technical school there was a technical school within walking distance of our neighborhood he says don't need to send him to a regular college and uh, there was another family where he was a congress leader thakur singh one of his uh, sons that stayed back in uh, pakistan and uh, converted to islam when the father died the son came mm-hmm. to be with with family mm-hmm. i remember that so there were stories like that uh, that we were watching in person watching in real life okay so uh, again to our audience uh, you are watching sunday stories live Uh, from the 1947 partition archive uh, professor amrit jit singh uh, is our guest uh, my name is uh, farooq khan uh, sir my follow up uh, question is that you are uh, you are talking about uh, you know your lived experience uh, and that you know how did a punjabi uh, sikh you know partition affected boy uh, ended up pursuing the academic interest that you did which is like you know african or african american studies how did that transition uh, take place and was anything of your lived experience included in this particular research that you pursued for such a long time and you continue to pursue well yes and no uh, when i got into african american literature uh i was not aware of direct connection but i think now almost 50 years later i can see connections but let me answer the first your main question so like uh, all good things in life uh, you know serendipity plays a role right i uh, mean uh, you are whistling down the street and uh, Uh, there's a beautiful woman coming from the other side and you fall in love that seals your fate in good and not so good ways 
<laughs> so uh, my story of how i got into african american literature is very simple mm. i came from delhi where i was registered to do my phd on hemingway acha and uh, i had i really liked hemingway uh, my uh, assessment of hemingway has kind of gone down i much feel much closer today to william faulkner than i do to hemingway but that's another conversation for another day <laughs> but uh, there was a course in american literature two part course the second part was on 20th century we are talking about uh, 1969 1970 and for some reason uh, because the uh, ma degree was in greatly in demand by high school teachers in the new york city area our graduate classes used to be like 80 100 people can you imagine wow acha okay. ma and phd students sitting in classes of 60 70 80 100 people mm. our professor tuttleton gave us a list of 100 texts for research for the final paper so he said please choose at least 3 because you may not get your first choice so i went to the library and I just think about it the three writer because we didn't have google <laughs> there was life before google as well <laughs> you had to go to reference books encyclopedias go to that card index and find something so i chose uh, uh, sinclair lewis upton sinclair and richard wright they were all on the list mm. but for some reason because i had heard about quote on quote negro literature in india uh, i was very much involved in american literature even during my ma days and my 3 years of teaching at delhi university kirodimal college uh, so I, i was hoping to get richard right but forget don't forget my name in the alphabet was towards the end singh oh. so i just kept very nervous i said am i going to get richard right or one of the other two writer fortunately no one picked richard right i got it i read native son by richard right that completely transformed my life mm. i decided after the book just shook me up no book other than crime and punishment had shaken me up so much you know at un, until then and so i i chosen a professor who had been to india he was actually a 19th century american literature man william gibson and i told him that i want to work only on richard right he was shocked <laughs> he did everything to dissuade me but finally when he found me determined to do it he sent me to a former student of his a, a jewish american guy edward margolis and edward was very nice he became one of my mentors he said amrit there are three books on richard right coming up nobody has done a good book on the harlem renaissance so why don't you choose to to work on the fiction of the harlem renaissance so that's what i did and that became the novels of the harlem renaissance and i have never looked back and now it's been 50 plus years and uh, i must say i think it's time to acknowledge it publicly my african american colleagues have been so gracious so supportive uh i have received a lot of affection and respect from them and i'm one of that community and fr- frankly i could uh, work for another four decades mm-hmm. and the work will not be done mm-hmm. while i was writing the dissertation a book came out called the harlem renaissance by nathan huggins who was a professor of history at columbia and i was a uh, uh, had the temerity to call him at his office at, during his office hours and you know he was so sweet he says amrit jit don't worry my book has not wiped out your book there'll be dozens of books and farooq today there are hundreds of books on harlem Absolutely. Absolutely. and every year two or three or four new books come out so harlem renaissance today is a much bigger field than it was so i started going to the shambhag center in harlem and rest is history 
Okay. Uh, again, uh, you are watching Sunday Stories live from the 1947 Partition Archive. Uh, Professor Amrit Jit Singh is our guest. Uh, my name is uh, Farooq Khan. So, sir, moving on from there, more recently you've brought out a volume on uh, literature of partition. Could you share how this particular project came about and what are some of the kind of findings uh, or, or things that you, yes, thank you. <laughs> so this is the American edition. Yeah. There's an edition in India published yeah. by Orion Black Swan. And I believe from uh, friends in Delhi, friends like Tarun Sen, who may be watching this program, that the book has circulated a great deal in India. And uh, so this happened with uh, Nalani Ayer and Rahul Garola and I, we did a pre-conference at the South Asian Conference in Medicine. And we had uh, about half a dozen presentations, including a couple of presentations by undergraduates. Wow. That the, the level of interest was very strong. So we decided to then write up a call for papers and. Uh, then I ended up as a Fulbright professor in Delhi, at Delhi University for 2014-15. And uh, we were uh, reviewing what we were receiving. By the way, uh, I might as well tell you that we were very keen on including essays by colleagues in Bangladesh and in Pakistan. And we did have a hard time. But finally, five scholars came through. Ambar Riyaz. Uh, Masood Raja uh, and uh, Kaiser Hutt uh, and uh, another scholar and uh, oh yeah, Elias Chatta, whom you have interviewed, yes. he contributed the essay on Kashmir. And then we had essay, uh, essays by Indian scholars on, for example, Tasneem Shah Naz, and I did the essay on Intazar Hussain. That is in the volume. Yes. But uh, we particularly tried to uh, uh, establish our point of view in the introduction. Uh, if you like, I can talk about that a minute. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So our idea was, uh, 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 for Saab, uh, to kind of move beyond. It was primarily a collection of essays on literature. But we were willing to kind of... Uh, go beyond uh, the, the disciplinary borders to include other things. Uh, so for example, Ambar Riyaz is actually a, teaches literature in Vancouver, but her essay is more a history of Pakistani identity. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to tell you about that, mm -hmm. uh, all the phases that uh, it went through, uh, all the way to Zia and Wahhabi influence. And she did uh, a, a great job. Uh, Dr. Masood Raja deals with a serial novel that was published in a newspaper, one of the longest novels in Urdu ever published. Kaiser Haq talks about uh, his uh, direct involvement in the Mukti Vahini. But he's also a poet. And he talks about uh, what his relationship to partition literature is. And uh, the same, and I... Uh, Outsiders, but not outsiders, because if you know Intazar Saab's work, he belongs to all of South Asia. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and I was uh, just uh, when I was uh, living in Delhi, I missed the opportunity to meet him. I yeah. you may not know that uh, uh, Dr. Aslam, who passed away, Abiba University in Karachi, and he used to visit India every year. No, I, 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 um, I fortunately met him in Delhi and in Lahore in Tazar Sahib. I met him like, you know, uh, quite a number of times and I was fortunate enough that he would visit uh, the class that I taught on partition and in that we were uh, we would teach Shari of source. So, and students were, and I you know it was our good fortune uh, uh, to meet up with him uh, repeatedly. Yeah, and, and Alok Bhalla has done a lot of yeah. good yeah. work on him and... Uh, Alok was very keen for me to meet him, but yeah. I was committed to a conference, I believe, in Goa at that time. So we couldn't meet, but we talked about Basti and we talked about his short stories. We talked about his philosophy. And uh, I was always uh, just uh, 
uh, aware of uh, his uh, strength that uh, mm-hmm. the Shia Muslim uh, living in Pakistan, he was talking about the importance of uh, staying connected to the ancient Indian civilization. Mm-hmm. And uh, he he had uh, uh, Buddhist and Hindu uh, icons. In fact, yeah, in the interview with the Lok Bhalla, he says something very stunning. He says, I am a Muslim, but a Hindu sits inside me mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think so. Anyway, to go back to the narrative I was building, which we tried to talk about in the introduction, we wanted to move towards healing. We wanted to move towards reconciliation. Uh, I remember when the book was getting promoted, a young woman scholar from Pakistan wrote to me, are you guys the kind of guy who will talk about Akhand Bharat? I said, no such thing. I said, Why don't you read the book? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our, our hope was uh, we may not have been always explicit that I, I mean, this is an issue that I hope we'll talk a little bit, but let me quickly state it. Why is it that the leaders on both sides, they ran away with the idea what, of course, I can understand the pressure of nation building. How is it that Nehru and Patel, after the massacre of 1 million people and after the displacement of 10 million people, thought that they did not have to do specific particular things in order to bring healing on both sides of the bottom. Why is it that we didn't think about something like truth and reconciliation? Why is it that we did not build memorials? Why is it that we did not allow people from both sides to meet and hug each other and try to forgive each other? Why is it that the narratives on two sides are so separate and they are, of course, under special pressure these days? more on the Indian side right now, are they are being kept separate. So when, for example, I'll say that, it's a kind of blunt thing to say, but I'm going to say that. When people, Hindus and Sikhs, talk about how many Hindus and Sikhs were massacred by the Muslims, I try to remind them to look at the population between Delhi and Amritsar and Delhi and Shimla, Delhi and Amala, where I grew up. I said, how many Muslims do you see there now? Almost none. I said, what happened to those Muslims? Like the Hindus and Sikhs in the West Punjab, families like ours, the Muslim families in the East Punjab were forced to do the same thing. They were forced to migrate. There were examples of Muslims in Delhi and Muslims in Punjab who migrated to UP or migrated to Hyderabad and stayed there for a while and came back. A clear light of day, Anita Desai, the novel, yeah. has the example of one Muslim family who went to Hyderabad. But most of them either were under the move or you are killed. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that this is where the title of our talk comes from, History and Memory. Because uh, we have created memories. Our memories have been created for us. Memories are being instigated for us. And we hold on to those memories and we are not ready to look at uh, so much evidence that contradicts those memories. Uh, Yeah. uh, yeah. Um, Again, uh... You are watching Sunday Stories Live uh, from the 1947 Partition Archive. Professor Amrit Jeet Singh is our guest. Uh, my name is Farooq Khan. Uh, question and answer uh, session is coming up. Uh, uh, please put in your questions in the comments box and we will uh, ask them in due course. Uh, right now, uh, Professor uh, Singh, maybe the last question that I will ask, uh, and maybe if you could provide a brief answer. Uh, and what I will do is that I'll kind of combine two uh, uh, of these questions into one. One is that, you know, how uh, important, and I think you've kind of touched on that, how important is it for this younger generation? Uh, to know about partition and is how have you included uh, conversations 
of partition in your classes, even though, uh, as you said, your primary focus has been on the African American identity. How much of partition uh, has kind of, you know, have you, have you, have you talked about it with, with your students? Thank you. That's a very good question. And uh, my uh, response is going to be a bit complicated. Okay. So when I was at Rhode Island College for 20 years, 1986 to 19, 2006, I got to teach courses on India and South Asia much more frequently. So one was the course on post-colonial literature. And uh, uh, I decided after one or two experiments that, that you can't do Africa, the Caribbean, and South Asia. It was just too much because our students need background for each region. So I reduced it to Africa and South Asia. So South Asia was pretty much 50% of those classes. But that was not specifically focused on partition. Uh, but I also taught a course on India for honor students, very bright students, and really loaded them with a lot of reading. And partition would be a part of it. The partition course in Ohio, I taught one soul only. Because what happened is, uh, Farooq Saab, when I moved to Ohio, my teaching load went from 3 plus 3 to 2 plus 2. Okay. And they already all, always had enough courses for me to teach in American literature and African American literature. So I taught courses on, uh, for example, a comparative look at African American and Asian American literature. Uh, I, I had a course on Faulkner and Toni Morrison that was uh, amazingly successful. I taught survey courses in American literature. I taught courses on the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, I once I taught a course on five major African American writers. So to so what I'm saying is, uh, and this is something because I'm for me I'm both. First of all, uh, the experience of working on something very different from my personal identity has enriched my life. I recommend it to anybody who is listening. Try to find an area, if you want to understand yourself better, find an area that is completely different from your own background. I mean, white Americans, black Americans, they work on China, they work on Japan. You know, and uh, sometimes I've been asked, why don't you teach American literature? Why don't you teach Indian literature? And my response always was, why not? Why do you want to, you know, just uh, limit me to the identity, my identity as you see it. I've always been trying to break out of those boxes. So African-American literature and history are also about conflict. They are also about empowerment. They are also about uh, healing. They are also about reconciliation. I mean, just uh, in one sentence, let me say, Whatever African-Americans gained through the Civil War in 1863 and 1865, they started losing it in 1877. And by 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, segregation, apartheid became the rule, law of the land. We do not address that again until 1963 under Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. The same president who did the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act also passed the Immigration Reform Act. So you see the connections? There would be no South Asians in the United States without the Immigration Act of 1965. And African Americans would not be so much more empowered today without the Civil Rights Act 1964 and the Voting Rights Act. So in my mind, in one body, these two streams are constantly getting integrated. They, they crisscross. So my imagination is always connected to both. So it doesn't matter whether I'm teaching a class in African-American literature, I'm teaching a class on partition or post-colonial literature. All these things come together. Mm. I hope that answers. It, it, it does. Uh, uh, thank, thank you for not just this particular answer, but a number of other, uh, 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 you know, uh, 
points that we've had. So now uh, we are open uh, to uh, questions uh, and uh, comments. So, um, okay, so we have your uh, uh, people. Uh, Amjad Khan Sahib said, Professor Amritjit uh, Singh, thank you very much for sharing your life experience. Uh, uh, I think there were some earlier comments as well. If someone could put those up, please. Yeah, I saw those. Uh, 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 Lekha Rai, this is yeah. amazing. Uh, truly is. I completely agree. Ahuja Teji, uh, amazing story. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Lakhvir Sidhu, uh, great, sir. So uh, uh, those of you who have uh, questions, please. Uh, it's always a privilege listening to you, Professor Singh Sahab, uh, Nitesh. Uh, sure. how, how about some questions, sir? Yes, I know. We've got we've gotten a huge kind of fan following of Professor. Yeah, Singh. we we uh, we don't we, uh, we don't need praises. Uh, <laughs> we need okay. questions. We yeah, need okay. some disagreement. So, uh, here, here is something. Uh, okay. Uh, Pashora, uh, Singh yeah, Sahib, Professor uh, Professor Pashora Singh. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks, Doctor Singh, for your informative conversation. Uh, I enjoyed your family's. Uh, relocation uh, much uh, before the fact that it, they were before the riots in Rawalpindi. Uh, this event triggered the unfortunate massacre on both sides. So he's talking about uh, what yeah. was in the what aftermath. happened in Rawalpindi. It, uh, yeah. uh, I think many people would consider, but I would still say, you know, the point I was making since nobody is asking a question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what I was saying, how. Uh, you know, these things get frozen. We hear stories. We heard about, uh, you know, an uncle got killed. Uh, you know, uh, people found uh, dead bodies in, outside their home when they opened them in the morning. Uh, in Delhi, in uh, Lahore, in uh, other places, in Jalandhar, in Ambala. And people will say, but ultimately, if we want to get out of this morass, if we want to get out of we need, need to become good neighbors. We need to become empathetic, compassionate neighbors. This idea of the Akhand Bharat. I mean, I, I often tell my uh, uh, Hindu friends who are inclined to the right, there are other names for them, which I will not mention right now, that uh, if you had a, a new India, if you imagine an India that included Bangladesh and Pakistan once again, the proportion of Muslim population will be close to 40%. And I tell them pretty directly, because I happen to <laughs> be direct most of the time, I said, you can barely tolerate 14% Muslim population. I think we have to consider, you know, what is... I. I I don't know as much about what's going on in Pakistan. Some of the visible things on the Pakistan side in the last few years have been good. Kartarpur corridor, and greater attention to minority rights. Of course, terrible things like happened, what happened to that Sri Lankan young man. Uh, those things uh, continue to happen. But, but the, the fact is that uh, the the and I, I mentioned to you uh, a couple of days ago, Abul Molana Abul Kalam Azad. Yes. He was very aware of it. it the, he, of course, he was opposed to Pakistan. And uh, he would have liked uh, Patel and Nehru and Gandhi to oppose it more vigorously. And in fact, that's why his autobiography was publication was delayed by a couple of decades. Uh, but his fear was that and I, I'm glad I'm coming back to it because I told you I wanted to make this point. Uh, that the formation of Pakistan is going to have serious consequences that Muslims are left behind in India. So, so the point that I was referring to earlier, why is it that Sardar Patel and Nehru were running away with the nation building project? without paying attention to the need. How could you really forget the need for some healing to take place? I think it's still not too late. Of course, healing uh, uh, and reconciliation efforts uh, made around 1950 would have been much more effective. 
But mm-hmm. even uh, 70 years later, it's not late for us to get together. That's why poets getting together, even in that uh, short space of one day in the Kartarpur corridor, several gatherings of Pakistani and uh, uh, Indian poets have taken place, especially Punjabi poets. Yes. Those yes. are beautiful gatherings. Yeah. I, I come away crying listening to them and they, how they interact with each other mm. and how they just uh, respond to each other viscerally as well as through the, their poetic imagination. Mm. So, uh, so we need to continue to build on whatever we can. Of course, uh, the fact that the governments have not lasted, at least now three or four democratic governments have lasted a considerable amount of time, I think uh, this is something to build on, uh, on the Pakistani side. And in the Indian side, the demonization of minorities that's going on, that's pretty dreadful. And uh, everybody needs to fight it. Looking away is not a choice. Keeping quiet is not a choice. And then uh, it's just amazing how many of uh, my progressive friends are falling into the uh, into the uh, the gutter of uh, mm. uh, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hinditwa fascist ideology. Uh, uh, again, uh, thank you. Uh, please, uh, and this is for the audience, please type your questions in the comments uh, boxes and we will choose some of them. Uh, uh, Ahuja Teji Saab uh, asks, Professor uh, Amrit uh, Ji, uh, thank you for sharing your amazing story. British News 6 uh, we were in very precarious situation during partition. If time could uh, go back, could six Sikh leaders uh, have done something different to keep Punjab united? Any mistakes they made during that time? So this is a question. This is a very good question, Teji Saab. Thank you for that question. I don't know if I have uh, good answers for you. But uh, I think the... Uh, Six had the option to, theoretically, they could have three options. They could have asked for a land of their own. I don't know whether they would have, that would have gone anywhere. They could have joined hands with uh, Pakistan. Uh, Jinnah Saab invited the Sikh leaders to uh, join. And that way, uh, all of Punjab could have stayed together. Uh, there, 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 there is some idea, very theoretical, I think, of uh, carving out a united Punjab. And the fourth is what actually happened, that Sikhs threw their uh, lot with uh, India and uh, they have had, uh, you know, a a kind of uh, fraught relationship in many ways, uh, particularly over uh, with Mrs. Gandhi and the 1984. In our introduction to the partition book, I was uh, telling Farooq Saab uh, the other day, there's a longish uh, note I have where I tried to, uh, that that was my composition and it's acknowledged. It's uh, 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 because we had hoped that someone would write about the Punjab situation in the context of the partition. I mean, don't forget, Urvishi Butalia started talking about partition after the Sikhs experienced the 1984 massacre. And let's not leave out what happened in Bangladesh in 1971. For me, these are all interconnected. I don't see that as a Pakistani story and this as an Indian story. Then what happened uh, with the 1992 with the Babri Masjid and things uh, continue to happen just a couple of days ago, what happened in Jahangir, Jahangir Puri in Delhi once again. So for me, once again, as I said about African-Americans and South Asians my, in my imagination, for me, all of South Asia is a is a is a, uh, a a unit in my uh, my bones and in my blood and in my imagination. All these things have contributed to uh, disturbing things throughout. In fact, Bangladesh is right now doing very well. That's an example for us to consider. If you mm-hmm. focus on the economy instead of focusing focusing on cultural and religious and communal and caste issues. All countries can do better. So just to kind of uh, uh, 
bring it together uh they just uh, what could have they done differently i don't know i really don't know i do know that a lot of things that happened in the 80s and the 90s could have been handled differently and uh, if you read that longish footnote in our introduction to revisiting partition i blame the akalis i blame bhindrawala but i one person i blame the most mrs gandhi she was the leader of the country she had the duty and the responsibility to respond to political demands and some of them were very simple political demand uh, anandpur resolution declaring amritsar a holy city uh, having a train called golden temple express what is so difficult about those demands and in 1981 uh, swaran singh who had been a minister in the congress cabinet for a long time he negotiated a deal with the akalis at night mrs gandhi said great in the morning she changed her mind she was obsessed with the defeat of the congress in the punjab and she did a lot of uh, things that could have been done for example even in terms of for example militants hiding in the golden temple why not deal with that problem immediately it's not as if uh, uh, the police had never gone into darbar sahib in amritsar before you cannot wait 3 years and allow the problem to fester which is what the and then attack the darbar sahib the golden temple as if it was a foreign country so i hope that answers to yes. some degree uh, thank you uh, uh, tarun uh, again our mutual friend uh, great to have you here uh, tarun thanks for the moving account and exchange of ideas to what extent can the metaphorical representation in partition literature and memoirs enable a reckoning with the long partition that persists till this day can a careful reading uh, of the works of manto atiya husain and intizar husain uh, take us in the direction of restorative memorialization and justice thank you tarun ji that's an excellent uh, question and that is also an answer to your question yes the answer is yes and uh, especially those three writers you mentioned i taught uh, uh, sunlight on a broken column frequently and uh, 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 atiya husain's uh, exploration of uh, the male patriarchy in terms of the zimmedari and then uh, the different experiences of the two cousins i often used to teach it with clear light of day where there are two sisters and in uh, atiya husain there are two uh, cousins uh, and students had a wonderful time writing essays comparing those two but certainly uh, the no- the novel goes on to the division of the country and uh, how the family that divided how people end up making different choices and uh, she handles uh, all those uh, choices with uh, respect and with compassion uh, whatever the choices were made uh, and of course manto is uh, uh, an amazing writer uh, Uh, he has uh, memorable short stories like khol de and uh, so many others uh, teka uh, toba take sing uh, and then intezar husain we talked about sure those are writers it's a good idea tarun you mentioned it because maybe there is a way to carve out samples of writing from uh, all these three nations i would include bangladesh too uh, and uh, 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 pakistan and india where uh, this uh, idea of uh, healing and reconciliation could be uh, become more focused mm-hmm. I, i i think we should attempt that thank, thank you, you for your question and the answer to your question that you have already supplied uh sarab uh, is again a, a great friend uh, and she's been working on partition and she's planning to uh, maybe make a film on this uh, as well so great to have you here sarab uh, uh, i'm a sick but i have the same 
blood as uh, many uh, as my Muslim brothers. The Sikhs preach peace and getting along with everyone and tolerance. How and why? Uh, uh, Oh, and why overnight enemies? Is religion good for mankind? Okay, these are like profound, big questions. So, yeah, yeah I mean, I, a professor, I, 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 yeah, no, each of us finds our own answers, but I would say once again, very quickly, uh, that uh, manipulation and instigation based on organized religion is different from the spirit of religion. If we are able to connect with the spirit of religion, whether it is Islam or the, whether it is Hinduism, which is very different from Hinditwa or Sikhism, uh, the ideas of uh, service, the ideas of humility, the ideas of uh, respect for your neighbor, they are central. But uh, we have uh, uh, people on both sides who like to keep, keep things, uh, you know, boiling in a, in a pot. Uh, with a mixture of uh, uh, reconstructed, distorted memories and uh, uh, hatred and uh, suspicion and mistrust. And we are seeing the consequences of that uh, in the electoral politics and in general social life in uh, India. Unfortunately, it's uh, unbelievable. I never thought I'll uh, see uh, someone like Obama elected. I never thought I will see someone like Trump elected. And the uh, same thing I would say about India. I never thought in my lifetime I would see the level of uh, degrading, dehumanizing, demonizing things that are going in, in my homeland. And I am deeply ashamed that those things are taking place. We should not allow them to take place in our name. Ultimately, people have to separate themselves, and uh, all of us should do that. Uh, uh, and, and thank you so much. Uh, uh, any more? Uh, we can take maybe one uh, more question if there is uh, uh, one. But uh, yeah, okay. If so, not, uh, may I read a poem? Yes, I was, I was just going to say that we have about a minute. Uh, thank you for for all this. I went to Pakistan and give me a great deal of time. Thank, thank you, uh, sir. It was a pleasure to uh, have you in Pakistan. Sir, please go ahead, because I, I was thinking... I, I, I'd like to out. end with one of the yeah. strands that you brought out in this conversation beautifully. Uh, there's a well-known poem by Langston Hughes. Yes, I too sing America. I'm the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Say to me, uh, nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too sing America. And I'm going to uh, give you a, a wonderful uh, translation of this poem in Hindustani uh, done by a, a science professor his name is K.K. Rishi. He retired from Kurukshetra University where I did a master's. I met him at a conference in 2014. And uh, he's done an amazing job, Farooq. And we'll go out with this. Absolutely. I sing in the I घर में जब मेहमान कहीं से आते हैं घर वाले तब मुझको यूं समझाते हैं देखो मेज के पास नहीं तुम आओगे आज रसोई में ही खाना खाओगे उनकी बात पे मन में मन ही मन में मुस्कुराता हूं किचन के अंदर डट कर खाना खाता हूं आई लव दैट टाइम डट के खाना खाता हूं वेरी पंजाबी यस खाना खाकर यूं तगड़ा हो जाऊंगा डील डोल पर अपने मैं इतराऊंगा देखूंगा फिर मुझे कौन समझाता है मेहमानों के बीच से कौन उठाता है रुख पर मेरे जब रौनक लहराएगी खूबसूरती मेरी उनको भाएगी उनको अपनी बातों पर शर्म आएगी 
मैं भी अमेरिकन हूं उन्हें बताता हूं मैं भी अमेरिका के नगमे गाता हूं एंड ही स्टार्ट्स द पोएम वॉल्ट विथ मैन आई टू सिंग आई टू सिंग अमेरिका वाई बिकॉज ही वॉज वेरी फॉन्ड ऑफ वॉल्ट विथ मैन टू सेंग अमेरिका so 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 this may not seem relevant no this, it is relevant this is, is relevant. kind of inclusivity yes that uh, nations in south asia sri lanka is under a lot of trouble right now yeah. uh, we can't leave out nepal and sri lanka and maldives it may disappear in a few years mm-hmm. and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, so the message is you see what i was saying throughout ंग इन If you like our oral history work and our mission, uh, please consider making a donation of any size. Uh, we rely 100% on donations as an NGO. In some countries, uh, donations are tax-free. Uh, links uh, are in this in in the description of uh, this video. So once again, uh, uh, Professor Saab, thank you so much, uh, and to the audience, uh, uh, thank you very much, and please uh, do tune in. next sunday for uh, the last of our uh, this particular season uh, thank you and it's good by uh, satri akal and khuda hafiz from lahore thank you farooq saab uh, you, you were absolutely wonderful to thank, thank you thank you thank have you. a great day you too bye bye